Welcome to Comics Are Awesome, brought to you by Alter Ego Comics. I'm Mark. And I'm Josh. And we are here to talk about this week's best comics. But before we get to that, I feel like I need to comment on something that was uh, brought up a couple weeks ago. It happened at New York Comic Con, uh, where there was a, a meeting between Marvel, Marvel higher-ups and retailers, and uh, one retailer started to go off on Marvel about their, their diversification of their line, uh, talking explicitly about uh, uh, gender diversity and, and physical diversity and ethnicity and things like that. And uh, someone posted a link to the article on the private Facebook group and asked for comments. And universally, everyone was kind of appalled and, you know, this guy's nuts. And I don't think neither Josh nor I chimed in, uh, but we talked about it internally and, and we just... I just want to take with our, this. With our inside voices. Yes, I talked about it in my head, and he talked about it in his head, and then... We have one of our famous yeah. telepathic conversations. Yes. <laughs> um, but, yes, uh, the, that that person or those people do not represent, unfortunately... Uh, well, not unfortunately. They, 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 they fortunately do not represent the majority of comic store owners, or at least those that run their stores uh, as a business. Um, you know, the, the store owners that I know were, were equally appalled at... At his his blow up and accusations and and use of inappropriate language, um, and, and if you've been watching this show, whether in its current incarnation as Comics Are Awesome or previously as Alter Ego Comics TV, you know that Josh and I love the majority, if not all, of uh, the newer, younger, more diverse characters at Marvel. We feel like those books are severely overlooked for one reason or another. Um, and I'm hoping I'm wrong that the readership in the industry does not like those things. Mm. Um, you know, my experience has been that people like things that are good. <laughs> but uh, we've also been proven wrong with that. Uh, we look at the success of Deadpool. <laughs> no offense to you Deadpool readers. I say Deadpool is not bad, but... It's it, not for everybody. It's just the same thing. And, and I will say this, over the same thing. I, I would argue that... You know, the Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, is for everybody. Um, I, I don't disagree. You know, unless all you want to read about is Walking Dead and, and Crossed. I mean, if that's what you want to read, if then... If you need murder and profanity, maybe Ms. Marvel's then not Ms. for Marvel's you. Then Ms. Marvel's just read things by uh, Garth Ennis. Yes. And, uh, He's always got a new book coming out. Yeah. And Alan Moore. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, because his books are great, too. But I, since we hadn't commented on it, it's been a few weeks since it occurred, but, you know, now that we're into Marvel Legacy, and we've got, uh, you know, easy jumping on points for for most of these titles, and most of these characters are sticking around. Yeah, so far nobody's really been yeah. subsumed I will say by that, the, the classic. I, to be completely honest, and we, we alluded to this uh, when we talked about the Legacy one-shot, the only new character that doesn't resonate with me is Robbie Ray as Ghost Rider. Mm. Um, I have no connection to that character at all. I much prefer Johnny Blaze or Danny Ketch. Um, I, I just don't care. <laughs> you see, and I'm in... The well, one, the same boat, sort of, but for a different reason. Is I don't ever, I've never cared about any version of Ghost Rider. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. I think it's a character that looks cool but has minimal substance. But I think uh, you know that Sam Alexander Nova is yeah. excellent. Kamala Khan Ms. Marvel is excellent. Amadeus Cho is excellent. Um, and whether that's individual, did they all need to have series introduced around the same times? I don't think so. And I think that's where Marvel stumbled. I think that's what ticked off a lot of readers. It should have been a gradual introduction of these characters. Uh, and not and not replacing the old school characters, and that's what happening in the yeah. case of Amadeus Cho as the Hulk. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is timing. It's the yeah. fact that you know we went within three or four months from having. I mean, because none of those char- I mean, none of those characters were originally introduced in their own series. I mean, Amadeus was around for a while before Kamala was in at least one or two issues of Captain Marvel ahead of time. Um, they just all kind of happened to start. And then all of the classic heroes were in comatized or unworthy, and like they, it just shifted very rapidly. Or dead. Or, um, yeah. And that did not work for everyone. Or they became Nazis. Or uh, yeah. he, it, he was not a Nazi. All right, I'm sick of equating yeah, yeah. Hydra with Nazis. <laughs> or he became hydrized. Yes, that's fine. Hydroxed. <laughs> and I think I like they, again myself. to, uh, I think Marvel made a mistake in that they. All that they were talking about for a while were these characters. Mm. Every press release, every, ooh, this issue sold out, ooh, this is back in print, and every pull quote, it was always about the new characters and not about the uh, the legacy characters. And there is a way to enjoy both, and that's what we do. Uh, right. Now, we have the ability to read every comic that comes out every week. Um, not everybody does, but it all comes down to buying what you like, You know, whether it's comics or collectibles or whatever. Vote with your dollar. 
Uh, that's the best way to do it. And to, the Supreme Court rule of dollars equal speech. Yes, so. uh, apparently. Look who's president. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> that's, that's not a statement one way or the other. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, that, that, that person does not represent us. Uh, I feel offended. I felt He's dirty. He's back to the retailer, not the yes. president. <laughs> I, felt, eh, I felt dirty <laughs> as a retailer. when I, I just felt like, oh, this is not helping anyone. This is not helping the industry. This is not helping... You know, if, if your views are that strong, you need to get out of the business and, and do something else. Maybe carry a, a sign uh, outside of uh, the San Diego Convention Center along with the uh, Jesus Freaks <laughs> that are there. Westboro Baptist Church. Yes. Okay, so enough about enough that. that. Just wanted to get that out there. Let's talk about this week's best comics. My pick is The Invincible Iron Man, number 593. This is the first legacy issue, The Search for Tony Stark, part one, written by Brian Michael Bendis, artwork by Stefano Caselli and Alex Maleev. This is incredible. It's the incredible, invincible, all kinds of awesome Iron Man. Bendis has been writing uh, various versions of Iron Man for several years. Um, I would like to see him... Uh, I, I, I do want to see just one version of Iron Man at mm. some point. I, I want to see Iron Man, but there can be Iron Heart. I don't want to see Doctor Doom as Iron Man. That's just me. Um, I, I want him to be... I like Doctor that Doom. story, though. I like yeah. that version of Doom. I just... Yeah. Well, but... Yeah. I... Yeah. But I digress, as I usually do. Well, it's a it's a it's a function of the medium. It's every week we're reading stories that aren't done. It's like a serialized novel during the era of Dickens. You know, you've got we're not seeing the end game. We don't get to watch a whole movie and then decide. You know, if if Thor if the Thor the Dark World uh, had stopped a third of the if I had stopped to review it a third of the way through or two thirds of the way through, you would have gotten a different review than you did after I watched the whole movie. And in this, we get the story in chunks. Yeah. So. But the great, what it is. The, the, one of the things I really liked about this is I am not following all of the Iron Man books. Uh, I he- I've read each of them at various times, usually when they first come out, to, so that I can say whether I like them or not and whether I think you would like them. But Bendis does a great job in the first you know, few pages. Well, and we get to the Doom stuff in the middle. And I should mention the Doom stuff is penciled by Maliev. Everything else is penciled by Caselli. Uh, and Stefano Caselli has upped his game, man. Mm-hmm. He has always been uh, a, an excellent artist, but I really noticed... Uh, it, he blew me away this issue. Uh, Alex Maleev's stuff is awesome too. But uh, this issue does a great job of setting up who all of these Iron People are. Who Riri Williams is, who the infamous Iron Man is, Victor Von Doom, and what is going on with Tony Stark, as well as the supporting cast of characters, Mary Jane Watson, uh, his mother, who... And I did not read any of that stuff, so this is my first exposure to his mom. His mom, uh, the rock star, or whoever she is. Rock star shield agent. Yes. Um, and the ending is a bit of a cliffhanger, and one of my favorite Iron Man armors is at the end, so I, I am, I, I, I like nostalgia, so the armor that shows up on the last couple pages means a lot to me, so, um, who wears the armor coming up next, Search for Tony Stark continues, and of course at the end we've got the Marvel Primer pages on the characters of Tony Stark and Riri Williams, um, good, good stuff. Uh, my pick of the week ran neck and neck, but ultimately, uh, Mighty Thor pulled it out. This is Mighty Thor 700, uh, part one of the death of the Mighty Thor, which at least as far as this issue goes is a bit of a misnomer. But on the other hand, Jane Foster has been dying of cancer for like five years. So I guess (laughs) it's a very long death of Mighty Thor (laughs) arc. Uh, but this is really cool. This is the uh, first issue in Legacy with the renumbering, going back to the classic numbers that really don't add up when you consider that Thor was not in the early issues of Tales to Astonish, that they're adding in there. Um, I, I just want to say I'm a fan of the Legacy number. No, I like... I, I realize I don't, they don't add up. I, I, You can put whatever number on the cover you want. I yeah. don't care. But if you're going to put a number and then explain why it's that number, I want your explanation to, to, make, sense. to make sense. Yes. And I don't I just think don't that want all of them a number do. one every two years. I don't want yeah. a number one every 18 months. I want, I, want, I want a graphic novel with a number one every two years. So when the Bendis run starts, we get volume one when trade, but it can be number 7,628 on the comic i don't care about that so anyway yes so this is written by jason aaron written by like or drawn by everyone who's ever drawn thor uh walt simonson Woo-hoo. somehow uh along with matthew wilson russell dodderman daniel acuna De- becky clunan chris burnham andrew mclean jill thompson mike del mundo olive copiel coipel possibly uh, and it was it was awesome. Um, this is an oversized issue. It is what six bucks, mm-hmm. uh, but it is it is beefy. It's 
probably what eighty pages, maybe sixty pages. Uh, it's much are larger there, than a regular. Any comic. ads in there? I, I think the ads are significantly reduced, but I can well, there's wrong. this weird stamp thing in the middle. Oh. Um, there are no ads until you get to the back. Yeah, we like that. Um, but what I really like about this, this is uh, this is sort of just like a love letter to the history of Thor, and you get kind of every incarnation of it. Uh, the, the framing sequence is the current Thor, uh, the unworthy Thor, the Odin son, talking to the Norn, who are sort of like the fates in Greek mythology. They kind of write everyone's destiny. And I, I have, it's no secret, I was a huge fan of Kieran Gillen's run of uh, Journey into Mystery, the featured Loki, that was very much about stories and mythology. And this leans a little in that direction, at least in the framing sequence. Uh, the Norn are being attacked... And the Norn essentially are um, myths, they're mythology, they bleed stories. And so we get the different bits of stories, the stories of Thor, the types of stories of Thor, um, covering the war Thor, the current mighty Thor, who gets into a tussle with uh, She-Hulk or Hulk. I, I really don't know what she's going it's by anymore. She Neither does she, it's actually, she in the Hulk. story. Well, the book is still called Hulk. I so. believe the legacy version is going to be She-Hulk. Okay, well, the trade versions are She-Hulk, too. So that would lend credence to your theory. Um, but we get a laundry list of artists drawing awesome stories with every incarnation. Young Thor, Old Thor, One-Armed Thor, Two-Armed Thor, uh, Redfish, Bluefish. And it sets up uh, Thor, Thor, Frog of Thunder. Thro What's his weird? Thor. Throg or no, something? I Throg, Thor of Thunder? Um, but it's it's really great, and it does a really good job of catching you up across all the different stuff that's gone on in Aaron's run, but also being awesome if you've read it and adding new little color to the story, and it pushing it forward, telling us where it's going, and where it's going is the death of the Mighty Thor. One way or the other, it's that's where we're headed. Uh, so just exceptionally awesome. You going with the next one? No, I'm not going okay. with the next one. I mean, eventually. All right, right, next now. up for me, Batman number 33... The Rules of Engagement, Part 1. This is an adventure that Batman and Catwoman go off on in uh, the Middle East. It appears to be the Middle East. It's a made-up country, but there's a lot of sand. Could be, could be someplace else. <laughs> uh, so we get uh, Batman uh, riding a horse with Selina. Which is the best possible version of Batman. Yes. Really. What the, the biggest selling point to this is we've had a lot of dark, heavy storytelling in Batman um, really since Tom King took over. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, even the ones that are fun are still yeah. Yeah, heavy. I mean, there have been little, little slivers of light that come through uh, but a lot of this issue is is upbeat, it's casual, it's, it's getting to see the Bat family, specifically everyone that's been a Robin, except uh, Tim. except uh, yeah, because he's Tim's still he's still in prison, in prison, Mr. Oz's prison, and Duke, who is not Robin. Well, but, but Duke's there. Yeah, I mean, well, no, but it's he's yes. he has he's never been Robin, uh, but he's referred to as the current Robin until Damien's like, no, I'm Robin. It's it's great. So you get Alfred and and the wards of Bruce Wayne and Ace the Bat Hound hanging out in the study, just just talking, and that's. That's great. You know, mm -hmm. you want to see that that the interaction between the characters, um, and then again, uh, Bruce and Selina are off on a mission. We're not entirely clear what it is, uh, but it is kind of clear by the end of the issue. Uh, I don't think I'm spoiling any anything by saying there is a reveal uh, that Alfred makes to the boys uh, about the engagement between Bruce and Selina in this issue, so we can see their reaction to. This impending, the impending num nuptials. It's nuptials, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's it's awesome. Um, but it's I wouldn't have like, and he's not really mentioning the sand thing is intercut through the whole story. Yeah. So it's both of them together. The and I think that really works. Um, if it was just the sand stuff, especially coming out of the last arc, it would have been a little heavy and a little flat for it me. It would not have been. But in intercut act, with probably. the Robins yeah. acting as like a Greek chorus for the uh, audience, kind of throwing their own stuff back at Alfred is just awesome. Oh, it's the other thing I want to mention is that the artwork's by Joelle Jones this issue, it's and pretty. she does an amazing job. I'm so Anytime Joelle Jones is drawing a comic, I'm excited. I think the last thing she did was the Supergirl miniseries yeah. that you really liked. So, um, I believe this is a two-part story, so part one out this week, and highly recommended. 
Oh, and uh, quickly, Superman 33 is out this week. This is part one of Imperious Lex. And uh, you know that Josh and I are big fans of Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason. They were absent of the last, uh, from the last couple of issues of Superman, but they return with this story arc, Imperious Lex. So if you've uh, been missing Tomasi and Gleason, they have returned. And as an addendum to his addendum, uh, Super Sons number nine is out this week, also written by Pete Tomasi, also featuring John Kent and uh, Damien and uh, Clark and uh, Awesome. Damien's not actually in that book, but he's in this one. Um, and it gave me all of the feels. I, um, I think after decades upon decades of reading Batman and Superman stories, we've become a little bit inured to the heroes and kind of the mythic tales. They're, they're nice every once in a while, but they get very heavy in, in the main book if it happens a lot, which is why the last several great writers have not done that, like Tom King. And, you know, Tom King had one issue that was very much I Love Batman, and it was a great issue. It was the first one, actually, for the most part, or the third one, mm. one of the early ones. Uh, and Schneider did a couple in his run. But doing it through the eyes of the new kids, both the way they look at their parents and the way new people look at them, is pretty awesome. Uh, but next up, the other book that ran neck and neck for my pick this week is Incredible Hulk 709. Uh, first book with the legacy numbering, I think. Mm -hmm. This is the Return to Planet Hulk Part 1. Planet Hulk being, of course, one of the greatest Hulk stories ever told. And it was told by Greg Pak, who's writing this issue. It's drawn by Greg Land. Is that his first name? It's Land. It's Greg, right? It must be. I mean, it must be Greg Land. I, I think so. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Greg Land. Um, so, uh, at the end of the previous issue, Amadeus Cho realized that he is not as in control of the Hulk as he used to be, or as he thought he was, perhaps, and shot himself into space uh, voluntarily so that he could kind of get his stuff figured out in this space-born laboratory where he couldn't Hulk out and harm anyone. And um, he gets a distress call from Sakaar. Uh, they need the Green Scar to come back. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm the Hulk. The Hulk needs to go to Sakaar. And he did, and it is, it is awesome. I, It's always a crapshoot when you take a classic story and revisit it, but Pack is doing an amazing job. Um, from the, One thing that I really like is this really calls into stark contract the differences between the Banner Hulk and the Cho Hulk. You kind of see the different niches they fill, niches they fill, and why they fill them, and it's, it's really great. Uh, but what I was the most awesome is Sakaar went from being kind of like a medieval, almost Roman era kind of thing, uh, and then was virtually destroyed by the thing sent to attack the Hulk that killed his family and everything, his wife and child, uh, when he left and came back. And now it's become sort of Mad Maxi. There's a lot of post-apocalyptic wasteland feel to it. There's roving bands of raiders fighting over resources. And it's just, it's awesome. It's, it's everything I loved about Planet Hulk just cocked a few degrees to the left, uh, featuring a different Hulk and just being awesome. And I'm beginning to question whether it is a different Hulk. I'm starting, I was always been my assumption that when uh, Cho took the power, he was absorbing the radiation into himself and then it was creating a similar effect in him. But it's almost like the Hulk personality is the same Hulk that was with Banner and now it's in Cho. And I don't, I don't know if that's true, but that's how I'm starting to feel with the last couple arcs and the way he, they've modeled the interaction between the two. So very, very exciting stuff. That is an, an interesting way to look at it. I had not thought about it. With the lock him in the trunk and the way they talk back and forth, like it feels like that Hulk definitely feels like it, well, it feels is that same Hulk. Right. Like Banner. that persona has been subdued maybe because of the transfer from one to the other. Right. And over time, he's exerting more control and we may see a... Or it could be his Hulk and he's just yeah. modeling it on that Hulk because he loves the Hulk and worships it and it's his psychic projection. I don't know, but it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's great, interesting great point. stuff. Chime in, uh, Greg Pack, if you're watching, and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last up for me is uh, Sherlock Frankenstein and the Legion of Evil number one. This just say that title again for me. Sherlock Frankenstein and the Legion of Evil. It's a wonderful time to be alive. It is. Now, this is from the world of Black Hammer, uh, created, written by Jeff Lemire. Artwork on this is by David Rubin. And uh, I will admit, I have never read Black Hammer. It is on my to-read list. I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I know it won the Eisner this year for Best New Series. Many people rave about it on the Comics Are Awesome Facebook page. So that is one of the reasons why I picked this up. Uh, the other reason is I wanted to see if it was new reader friendly. If someone who was not familiar with the world of Black Hammer could pick up Sherlock Frankenstein and the Legion of Evil. I'll say the complete title every time. Because uh, it's awesome. And enjoy it. And I absolutely <laughs> did. 
Uh, the whole uh, thing is kind of focused on Lucy Weber, who is the daughter of Black Hammer, uh, and and I don't remember what their Justice League team was, um, but Black Hammer was a member of a, a Justice Society type organization uh, that that fought bad guys for a long time, uh, and then several of the heroes uh, got old, retired, went missing, and, and Black Hammer is one that has gone missing, and his daughter is investigating his disappearance, and she thinks a good way to do this is by checking up on, on the villains that he fought, and one of the last ones that he fought was Sherlock Frankenstein, so this sets her off on a journey to find Sherlock Frankenstein, who has also been missing for a long period of time and she visits a, a, a an Arkham Asylum type place that's run by a former member of their league of people what I, I have to find it it's gonna bother oh the Liberty Squadron uh, the Liberty Squadron is the name. Uh, so, uh, and it's kind of funny there's he's like a Hawkman type character but he's all old now and, and runs the prison <laughs> Uh, and she interviews a couple of the, the inmates that uh, were associates of uh, Sherlock Frankenstein. And it's just, it's it's very accessible. It's well written. It's a love letter. I think Black Hammer is a love it letter is. to uh, the golden and silver age of, of heroes. Um, so if you are a, a fan of those types of things, whether they're over at Marvel or DC, I would definitely say this is more DC-like than, yes. than Marvel. That well, I that's would, a function of the age. When you're talking yeah. about the golden age, the Marvel golden age was like three people. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> Um, but I would definitely recommend checking it out. I enjoyed it and plan on staying with it, and I will get around to reading Black Hammer <laughs> one of these days. Yeah, I Black Hammer, it. in the same way that um, Watchmen is a bunch of analogs of existing heroes taken and thrown into a dark 80s reality, this is analogs of existing, of a recognizable heroes, and it is, it is a love letter. Like, this story wouldn't work with the real heroes, mm -hmm. but in these sort of varied forms, and it's, it's more like versions or echoes of the heroes. It's, it's top-notch. Jeff Lemire knows what he's doing. Uh, next up, we've got two new number ones on the indie front. We've got Maestros uh, by Steve Scarocci, who's writing and drawing and coloring by uh, Dave Stewart, because he colors, like, every book on the freaking when planet. When he's not performing with Annie Lennox in the yeah. Eurythmics. Uh, this two is of you will get that uh, a weird <laughs> land of magic. Um, it's It has a lot of a feel, like, curse words a little bit. Because you've got people coming from a land of magic, living in the real world, and seeing the interaction between the two. Um, Scrochy is... If that's how you say it. That's how I say it. <laughs> just because it's fun to say. Scrochy. Like, like Jim Karoshi, but he's a drawer and a writer. Um, he's written a lot of books that I enjoyed that I can't necessarily give to everybody. Wonton Soup is an amazing cooking manga adventure in space. Uh, and just that sentence should tell you everything you need to know about Steve Scrooge. But he's done a lot of things across a lot of genres. I have to say, hands down, this is the best looking book he's ever drawn. Like, I oh, immediately yeah. did not realize it was even his art. His style is much tighter. Uh, it still has his kind of love for detail and little visual jokes, but it's it's beautiful book. Um, and we get a, a, a prince who's uh, been sort of dethroned or de disowned by the family, but he has to be brought back in when his father, the god king of their reality, is murdered. And it's about magic and family and penises. Uh, so this is an adult book, not for everybody. Uh, but super, super fun. Well, the, before you move on to that, yep. I, I think there's a little bit of saga in there, too. I can see that. Uh, I think if you're a fan of curse words or saga or just looking for something new and amazing to look at that has a solid story, you know, Maestros is the way to go. Uh, also, number one from Black Crown, which is an imprint at uh, IDW. We've got Kid Lobotomy, number one, written by Pete Milligan, uh, with art by Tess Fowler. And Pete Milligan is probably best known for Shade the Changing Man and a laundry list of other uh, books over the last 30 years or so. Uh, but he tends to write weird crap, and this is no exception. Uh, we've got if a... If you like the weird stuff. We do the weird stuff. Uh, we've got a rock star who has a break... He's not even really a rock star. He's a, he's a performer who's kind of mid-level. Uh, who has a breakdown, and he... His family has a weird empire of freaky-deaky hotels, and they kind of give him one to run, and he turns it into a sanitarium, and there's lobotomies and crazy people and bugs and incest, sort of. Um, it is nuts. It is, it is just nuts. Uh, but it was a ball to read just to follow... Anytime you have a viewpoint character whose touch on reality is not what it might be, it gives you some really interesting storytelling potential where every page could be a cliffhanger or a reveal or a reversal because the person telling you the story doesn't know what's real. 
Uh, and this definitely has that feel to it. Um, if you like stuff like Umbrella Academy or uh, any of the Young Animals books over at DC, like Doom Patrol and stuff, I think this would probably be right up your alley. Yeah, absolutely. And just to further explain the Black Crown imprint a little bit more, uh, this is Shelley Bond's new imprint over at, you did say IDW, right? I did. Uh, Shelley Bond took over from Karen Berger as the Vertigo editor-in-chief uh, when Karen Berger left. So Shelley was doing a lot of the uh, stuff that came out from Vertigo over the last... I would say five to eight years. Yeah. Um, so if, if those were your jam, then you definitely want to come over here and check out Kid Lobotomy, which is the first out of the gate. So that is it for this week. All kinds of awesome stuff to pick up at your local comic shop. Go out and support them. Stories matter, people. They absolutely do. So turn off the TV, stop reading the news, and pick up a comic. And we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.